Good morning, everyone. My name is Rakia Weddington. To my evaluators, Dr. Short and Dr. C. Kewels. To my family, my friends, and classmates. Thank you for attending my capstone exhibition for the Master of Arts in Teaching and Secondary History. It is truly an honor to have arrived at last to this final milestone in my journey to teacher certification. I honestly believe that I owe this achievement to all the unforgettable teachers who I had the privilege of learning from throughout my years as a student. Yet there is one teacher who sticks out in my memory the most. My 10th grade world history teacher, Mr. Butler, made history come alive for me in a way that I had never experienced before, nor did I think it was possible. Like many of my peers, I thought history was boring and irrelevant. In fact, before taking Mr. Butler's class, it was actually one of my most hated subjects. But that didn't deter Mr. Butler, because he helped me explore history in a way that I learned to put myself in a story. And as I painted pictures in my mind of historical events and figures, he helped shape those pictures by prompting me to think as a historian and consider causation, chronological and social context, as well as helping me to shift my perspectives as I view history through my own imagination. And because of his enthusiastic approach, his obvious love for the content, and his strong desire to help students succeed in his classes, he ignited a passion in me for both history and teaching. Looking back, I can clearly see how he upheld one of the most essential ideals of classroom democracy, engaging students in the curriculum through instructional practices and strategies that create lasting learning experiences. And I didn't know it at the time, but he was also instilling early in me what the National Council for History Education has established as the historian habits of mind. The NCHE believes that historical thinking develops a unique capacity to comprehend human situations, challenges, and interactions. Thinking historically introduces students to the wonders of the past and fosters the ability to make judgments about the present. History's habits of mind articulates this distinctive approach as one that leads towards engaging with and understanding the contemporary world and serves as a foundation for lifelong productive learning and active citizenship. Hence, the five foundational modes of inquiry in history are thinking in terms of causation, change over time, contingency, context, and chronological frameworks, drawing upon and synthesizing the content and methodologies of humanistic and social scientific disciplines to study and interpret the past, analyzing the interplay between choices individuals have made and the developments societies have undergone, understanding the social and aesthetic richness of different cultures, and consulting with and analyzing primary sources. But to further break down these tenets for a better understanding and a clearer picture of what the goals are for history students, the NCHE desires students to, one, grasp the significance of the past in shaping the present. Two, Perceive past events and issues as, as they might have been experienced by the people of the time with historical empathy rather than present-mindedness. Three, read critically to discern differences between evidence and assertion and to frame useful and appropriate questions about the past. Four, interrogate texts and artifacts posing questions about the past that foster informed discussion, reasoned debate, and evidence-based interpretation. Five, Recognize that history is an evolving narrative constructed from available sources, cogent inferences, and changing interpretations. Six, appreciate the diversity of cultures and variety of historical contexts, as well as to distinguish elements of our shared humanity. Seven, understand the impact made by individuals, groups, and institutions at local, national, and global levels, both in effecting change and in ensuring continuity Eight, realize that all individuals are decision makers, but that personal and public choices are often restricted by time, place, and circumstance. Nine, negotiate a complex, often uncertain, and ambiguous world equipped with the appreciation for multiple perspectives. And finally, 10, engage in patient reflection and constant reexamination of the past and present. These tenets ensure that students are thinking critically, properly engaging the curriculum, and as I've already mentioned, they further support the democratic classroom ideal of providing relevant and meaningful instruction. 
But beyond helping students to think critically, the democratic classroom Drikers holds is one in which there is a sense of community established and everyone is valued equally. In his work, Logical Consequences, he maintains that in order for teachers to implement democratic classrooms, there must be a collaborative community, learning community established. His belief is that teachers should encourage students to take participatory roles, don't engage in power struggles with students, establish fair and clear rules that must apply to all students, involve students in developing those simple classroom rules, and teach discipline to students rather than impose it. This all means that in a democratic classroom, the teacher is not a dictator who rules with an iron fist, but a facilitator of learning. He or she understands that in the classroom community, every member makes a valuable contribution, and the teacher guides students in the learning process through engaging and relevant curriculum. <clears throat> I plan to build community in my classroom by giving my students important and essential roles and inviting and valuing their input. But if I'm honest, it's the engaging and relevant curriculum ideal that I believe to be the most essential principle of classroom democracy. In fact, Manning and Butcher and nearly every theorist that they reference also assert that teachers who consistently implement engaging and meaningful instruction typically have very few behavior issues and enjoy a more harmonious and academically successful classroom. This means that matters of classroom and behavior management aren't hindering the student's learning. Surprisingly, I was actually able to pull off this complex strategy during my apprenticeship. Of course, it wasn't until the last quarter of the school year that I could implement it consistently and smoothly, but I accomplished it all the same. In fact, I can recall one particular lesson that absolutely makes me gush with pride every time I recount it. At this time, my sixth graders were nearing the end of the Canada unit and were finishing up the country's history as well. The topic of the class lesson for that day was the Quebec independence movements of the late 20th century. I could tell that many of them were struggling with trying to piece together this historical puzzle. So in order to help my students understand why the separatists of Quebec were pushing to make the province, province an independent nation, and why this movement failed, I first reminded them of why the citizens of Quebec seemed to feel a sense of isolation in the first place. I depicted for them a scene in which the French colonists and the American Indians cohabitated around the area of the St. Lawrence River and had built a positive rapport between them. I reminded them that because the French had no intention of trying to take over the land on which the natives had already been making their living, the French were able to freely and safely prosper in the fur trade in that area. However, when England decided to set up shop in the same area and claim it for the throne, the French and the natives joined forces in the French and Indian War against the English in 1754. But when England won, the natives were pushed west and only a few French colonists remained in modern day Quebec to be ruled by England. As Quebec became the only Canadian province dominated by French culture, many citizens of Quebec felt underrepresented in things like national government, media, and English as the sole official language. Consequently, at various times of the late 20th century, separatist groups in Quebec rose to push for independence of Quebec. Yet each time the movement would fail at garnering enough support and thus dissipate. So now that my students were armed with this background history, each class period was divided into three groups. One group represented the separatists. The second group represented the loyalist group, which was loyal to Quebec remaining a province under Canada. And the third group represented members of the national parliament who were also citizens of Quebec. I've given you the samples of each group's work so that you can get a better understanding of how this activity unfolded and get a sense of the efforts put forth. So once the groups were constructed and set apart, each member of the separatist group was instructed to give a legitimate reason why Quebec should break away from Canada and become independent. And in order to help them come up with legitimate reasons, they were prompted to consider matters like economy, government, natural resources, borders, military power, trade, and others that they could think of. These prompts were also written out and given to them so that they could refer to them as they constructed their arguments. After every member had written out his or her reason, these reasons had to be reduced to the five most compelling on a separate sheet. The loyalist group was given the exact same instructions, except in favor of Quebec remaining a part of Canada. Now, in order to ensure that every student made a significant and valid contribution to the group's overall effort, and to implement the needed differentiation for this critical thinking task, 
I paired some high achieving students with the low achieving students of each respective group so that my struggling students could receive the help that they would need. Both groups were informed that once they had narrowed down their five most compelling reasons, they would present these reasons to the group of parliament members in a formal document, which is the front template that you see at the beginning of each sample work packet. The group of parliament members was instructed to ponder and consider some of the possible arguments of each group while the groups were convened. They too were advised to consider economy, government, etc. However, after receiving the formal documents of compelling re reasons from both sides, the parliament members were to consider and discuss both sides before submitting private, individual votes, but from a neutral standpoint. The results from this activity revealed that with every class period, the decision of the parliament was always to have Quebec remain a part of Canada. And although the separatist group in each class period always gave a loud boo at the decision of the parliament, it was more than obvious that all the students were thoroughly engaged and enthusiastic about the activity and the overall lesson. In fact, virtually all of them reported that they recalled the activity when they came across the topic on the CRCT. Now, I do realize that there are many other factors to consider, to consider when implementing collaborative and interactive instructional methods. Effective classroom and group management are probably the biggest two. So, in an attempt to implement good classroom and behavior management during what would be one of the most engaging and interactive lessons of the year, I was very strategic in the way that I structured and comprised the groups. Larson and Kuiper state that benefits from a relational teaching approach include knowing how to assign students to groups because you know each student's strengths and weaknesses and you understand pressures and influences on a student that may affect their behavior in class. Therefore, I pulled from my experience in Dr. Brown's classroom management course and used an effective behavior management strategy in which I gave my students who caused the most behavior problems leadership roles. That's right, leadership roles. This not only showed them that I recognized their capabilities, but it also gave them a positive outlet to exercise their energies. And just to give you an idea of the kinds of roles that were delegated, some students were asked to be the person who kept the group on task, while other students were chosen to be the reporters of the group's efforts and progress. Secondly, I, I took into consideration the diversity in my class periods and used that factor to strategically construct my groups in order to bring out some of their unique skills, abilities, and pre-existing knowledge. For example, I knew that my students were not only diverse in their cultural backgrounds, but also in their achievement levels, critical thinking skills, creativity, and, in, and even in ways as practical as levels of maturity, motivation, and enthusiasm. So, for instance, I made sure to place students who love to challenge conventional wisdom and order in the group that would require going against the established order, i.e. the separatist group. This move was as much a classroom management strategy as it was an effort to acknowledge and appreciate the diversity in my class period. Now in terms of addressing cultural diversity, my lesson and activity ensured that students of varying ethnicities could relate and personally connect to the content. For example, when my students learned that the French-speaking citizens of Quebec took issue with English being the sole official language of Canada, this fact was able to speak personally to the Hispanic students in my class peers who often confided in me that they are sometimes made to feel inferior because their primary language is Spanish. Also, when considering the fact that the citizens of Quebec felt underrepresented in things like government and media, this information was able to speak to my African American, Asian, and Hispanic students. But another factor to consider in implementing collaborative learning is to recognize and acknowledge its limitations. For instance, the direct instruction that I implemented through the recounting of the background history was an essential part of the overall lesson. Without it, the students wouldn't have fully comprehended why there was such a rift between Quebec and the other provinces, thus hindering them from making compelling ar arguments for and against Quebec independence. Still, I want to acknowledge the fact that many theorists, including Larson and Kuiper, posit that students learn more, learn better, and perform better when they collaborate with peers to do history rather than passively hearing it recited. So it says here, research studies consistently find that cooperative learning has positive effects on student achievement because the process of, of interaction with others promotes learning. Students often learn more and learn more quickly than students working alone. In light of this, another collaborative strategy that I look forward to implementing is helping my students to understand the trans time transcending significance and magnitude of Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation. 
and I plan to accomplish this by guiding them in launching their own reformation. In this lesson, students will learn about Martin Luther's grievances and experiences with the 16th century Catholic Church through group stations. Students will be split into strategically structured small groups and will rotate through the stations which each, which each provide a piece of the early Reformation puzzle. For instance, in one station, a group will read a passage from their textbook in order to get an understanding of the social context of the time. This passage would more than likely describe the political role and ultimate authority of the church before the Reformation and also describe many of its long-standing unjust practices such as the selling of indulgences, abuse of papal authority, and forbiddance of the laity to study <coughs> sacred texts on their own. Another station may provide a primary source such as Martin Luther's 95 Theses for students to consider and discuss. Then, once the group has consulted with the text, primary source, picture, etc., there will be a discussion prompt to guide each station's group discussion. After each group, after, after each group has completed the station rotation, the whole class will restore the classroom to its normal structure and we will hold a class discussion that will be guided by my questions in order to recap what was learned. After the discussion, I will challenge students to engage what they have learned through a written assignment. In this assignment, students are asked to think of an institution such as school, family, religious organization, government, etc., in which they have been grieved by many injustices. Then they will construct their own 95 pieces. Of course, they won't have to list 95 grievances, but they will be instructed to list at least five that they consider to be the most revolutionary according to the institution that they're protesting. And they have to justify the legitimacy of each grievance. Now, in terms of assessing both, assessing both of these lessons, I wanted to ensure that they upheld Stiggins' idea of assessment for learning through their performance-based structure, but I also wanted to ensure that they honored the new common core standards which put an emphasis on more development of writing skills in social studies classes. So besides the assessment of each student's written contribution, both activities also had a built-in per performance assessment that would both challenge and engage my students, thus creating lasting learning experiences and securing enduring understanding. Furthermore, the assessments lent themselves to differentiation and appreciation for diversity in the classroom. These achievements are the essence of, es essence of assessment for learning, and learning that endures, as I have already emphasized, is the ultimate goal. And as a lifelong learner, I understand the value of research and education. So during my research sequ sequence, I really wanted to explore a topic that I'm passionate about. I thought about issues in education that really concern me and motivate me to make a personal and honest contribution to bringing about some resolution through my research. I took the research mandate seriously and thus decided to make it personal for me so that I would truly invest the kind of effort and scholarship required to implement sound and ethical research. So when it was time to pick a topic and identify an issue or problem, I began by investigating cultural issues in education. I stumbled across a research study article that made the inference that African American adolescent females who reject their Afrocentric image are more likely to engage in sexually risky behavior while those who are proud of their features not only abstain from and avoid sexually risky behavior but also possess a high self-esteem, high self-worth and self-efficacy and hold high life ambitions. After reading this article and being very intrigued, I thought back to my own adolescence and pondered whether my perspective of my own black features affected my ambitions and goals. And from that reflection, I decided to apply that question to my study. So for my research question, I asked, is there a correlation between the way that African-American adolescent girls evaluate their Afrocentric appearance, meaning their skin tone and hair type, and the way that they evaluate their academic self-esteem? And what I found in my study was that Regardless of how the sample of African American girls evaluated their image, the evaluations of their academic self-esteem did not reflect those varying opinions. In other words, although the girls' evaluation of, evaluations of their black features vary, the evaluations of their confidence and academics were all consistently high. Therefore, the implication for teachers from these findings is that because the grades of African American adolescent girls will more than likely not reflect their self-esteem, it is therefore up to the teacher to look past their academic status in order to help build the self-concepts, self-worth, and self-esteem of African-American girls. And since the fundamental ideals of classroom democracy advocate valuing every member of the classroom community, 
then naturally the self-concept, self-worth, and self-esteem of all members should be built in the process. As I conclude and reflect back on my initial definition of classroom democracy, I can't help but laugh at the fact that I thought a democratic, class, a democratic teacher and class lesson were bound to look like this every day. Just do whatever you want. I want to learn from my teacher. Besides that, Freddie, what do you like to do? I don't know. Learn stuff. Just go out and have recess. My parents don't spend $15,000 a year for recess. What, you want to learn something? Yes, I do. What, you want me to teach you something? You want to learn something? All right. Here's a useful lesson for you. Give up. Just quit. Because in this life, you can't win. Yeah, you can try. But in the end, you're just going to lose big time because the world is run by the man. Who? The man. Oh, you don't know the man? Oh, it's everywhere. In the White House, down the hall, Miss Mullins. She's the man. And the man ruined the ozone. And he's burning down the Amazon, and he kidnapped Shamu and put her in a chlorine tank, okay? And there used to be a way to stick it to the man. It was called rock and roll. But guess what? Oh, no. The man ruined that, too, with a little thing called MTV! So don't waste your time trying to make anything cool or pure or awesome, because the man's just going to call you a fat, washed-up loser and crush your soul. So do yourself a favor and just give up! Oh, Mr. Schneebly, it's after 10 on Tuesdays. The children have music class now. Right, okay. Uh, good work, people. We will continue with our lecture on the man when we return. Have a good music class. The that is what I thought a Democratic teacher looked like initially. The Democratic class lesson. Okay, Freddie, that was awesome. You're rocking, but it's a little sloppy Joe. Tighten up the screws, okay? Zach, dude, what's up with the stiffness, man? You're looking a little robotronic, okay? Let's uh, grease up the hinges and listen. Loosey goosey, baby. Loosey goosey. I'm just playing it the way you told me. I know, and you know what? It's perfect. But the thing is, rock is about the passion, man. Where's the joy? You're the lead guitarist, and we are counting on you for some style, brother! So try this out. This is an ancient technique. It's called power stance. That's it. Power stance. You own the universe. Now give me an E chord. Just go... But let me hear... Yeah, now raise your coverage of rock. It's a toast to those who rock. Now smile and nod your head and you don't even see your eyeballs wide like there's something wrong. Yeah! Now, do it again. Give me that. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, let's do it again from your not hardcore. One, two, three. Wait a minute. And the letter of the rich was way hardcore. Homework is to listen to some real music, get inspired. For Blondie, Blondie. For Lawrence, yes. That's the name of the band. Listen to the keyboard solo on Roundabout. It will blow the classical music out your butt. Okay, for you, Rush, 2112. Neil Peart, one of the great drummers of all time. Study up. Um, are we going to be goofing off like this every day? Uh, we're not goofing off. We're creating musical fusion. Well, um, are we going to be creating musical fusion every day? Yeah. Get used to it. Thankfully, I now realize that democratic doesn't mean that the classroom becomes a rock party every day. Because of my Fox Fire experience, where I was challenged to question and abandon traditional teacher-focused principles, I now understand the benefits of democracy in the classroom and have a clear understanding of what it means to implement a democratic classroom. Thanks to Dr. Hilton Smith, I, I hold firmly to the 10 Fox Fire core principles. 
One, from the beginning, learner choice, design, and revision infuses the work teachers and learners do together. Two, the work teachers and learners do together clearly manifests the attributes of the academic disciplines involved, so the attributes become habits of mind. Three, the work teachers and learners do together enables learners to make connections between the classroom work, the surrounding communities, and the world beyond their communities. Four, the teacher serves as facilitator and collaborator. Five, active learning characterizes classroom activities. Six, the learning process entails imagination and creativity. Seven, classroom work includes peer teaching, small group work, and teamwork. Eight, the work of the classroom serves audiences beyond the teacher, thereby evoking the best efforts by the learners and providing feedback for improving subsequent performances. Nine, the work that teachers and learners do together include rigorous, ongoing assessment and evaluation. And 10, reflection, an essential activity, takes place at key points throughout the work. These 10 core practices are the blueprint for building and maintaining a democratic classroom. And with this blueprint, I am able to ensure that class is student-centered and student-focused. Ensure that students have a significant voice in the workings of the classroom, and ensure that class becomes a community in which meaningful and lasting learning takes place consistently. In my pedagogy paper, I spelled out in detail how I plan to further apply and broaden my knowledge and skills acquired through this program. But in my exhibition, I wanted to showcase how I've already begun to put these things into practice. I hope that I was effective in my approach. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes my capstone presentation. But before I end completely, I want to thank Chris Moore for all of his help and encouragement, Dr. Hutchison Williams for her tireless efforts in getting me through this program smoothly and successfully as my advisor, and I want to thank all of you for your time and participation. Panelists? particularly with Georgia middle school students. Um, but it sounded like it was wonderful. Um, and it's, in my own opinion, just the way something like that should be done. Um, but authentic audience takes that even a step further. So do you have any ideas for how you would provide activities that would have an authentic um, I think some great ideas would be the kind of like the pen pal kind of. I think that would be really um, helpful in the sense that it would really get students to think outside of themselves and really consider other perspectives. So, kind of doing a pen pal um, kind of assignment. Also, bringing people in from the community to you know listen to them discuss or um, them just putting on a kind of like a it or you know just things like that bringing people from the community into the classroom um, and going out into the community as well so. um, along that lines I think a younger student some time ago who actually had students get involved in a local kind of a small local controversy but they to the 
lines, and some of those lines were published. Because, you know, they, <coughs> they were, they were well-crafted. They didn't just whip off the first draft and send it out. Yeah. Um, but they learned some things about the issues, and over the course of that developed their opinions and their letters. So that's, that's another, good. another possible variable. question. Um, in your apprenticeship, did your host teacher use democratic principles in the classroom? Because um, I, I noticed you kind of referred that it maybe didn't work out that way. He didn't. Um, he was very, um, his principle was, you know, teacher-centered, you know, focus on me, I will talk, you will listen. Um, in fact, there were many times when students wanted to um, provide input, they wanted to really explore a topic deeper. Um, we actually were talking about the Holocaust at one, one time, and he literally told everyone to hush, you know, to be quiet, let him get through the material because he was trying to, you know, hurry up and cover all the material. So there were many occasions where he silenced them. They, they couldn't discuss, they couldn't really, you know, delve deeper into the content, so. So did that pose a problem for you when you tried, did you try to, to do, you know, your more democratic way of doing things with kids? When I did, when I, you know, had my, my unit that I planned and I implemented it, he didn't, um, he didn't hinder me in any way, but he would make, you know, you know, remarks about how, you know, he, I, one time I remember him saying, he said, oh, well, you're dancing on the wild side or you're playing with fire, you know, with implementing so much group work and, you know, I just kind of laughed it off, but he didn't really hinder me or anything or try to, you know, tell me not to do something. Mm -hmm. um, he would try to rush me, though, I would say. So, yeah. Were the kids open then to the way that you did? Oh, things? most definitely. They were really excited. Good. Really engaged. Good. Thanks. You mentioned the way at the beginning. historical habits of mind. And I picked up on a couple that I, well, a couple that I thought, okay, really important, and I can see how the kinds of things that you're talking about doing would contribute to those, particularly historical empathy. Yes. And, and developing a context so that students can begin to understand the situation that historical actors were in yes. and that they may not have seen the same choices that we might see from this distance. Mm -hmm. um, so I think role play is really important. Oh yes, yes. I agree. Um, one of them hit me as especially important in the current social climate and that is discerning the difference between evidence and assertion. We have a lot of assertion going around the airwaves these days and the internet um, without any evidence to back it up, or sometimes with totally made up evidence to back it up. And I'm wondering how you teach students to deal with that. And um, this is an honest question. I, I would like to know yes. how to do this. Yeah. Um, I think that's where primary sources are so important. Um, and having them to compare the primary sources up against, you know, some of the secondary sources that may have, you know, some of the assertions in them. Um, so they can really understand this may be an assertion because the primary source here is, is not lining up. You know, I think that's where primary sources are really, really key to, you know, avoiding those assertions and taking them as fact or taking them as, you know, this is what occurred and really merging that into the content itself purely. So and that's a really good idea. But sometimes the primary sources may be full of assertions too. That's true. That's true. Um I think that's something I'm gonna have to give a lot more thought into. Um, it's it's a it's a big concern these days and you're hardly the only person to have to think about it. I, I think I will, definitely when we discuss, 
you know, as we're reading the text and we're looking at and consulting with primary sources, I think just being and teaching them to be able to um, decipher what is truly what you know what went on, truly pure content, and what is an opinion or you know, what is an assertion. I think just doing that, implementing that consistently, always discussing those things and bringing pulling that out is going to be helpful with that. But I definitely will give that more thought because that's important and that's that's very true. The primary sources themselves they have a lot of assertions. So I think you're probably right about that, and maybe. Also, just consistently asking students if there's other evidence to back that up. Yes. That's good. You've got one that students often get to get, which is pros and cons of distilled instructional. Strategies and more than that. Panelists, did you have any other questions? No. I think I'm good. Audience, any questions? You've already asked me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you.